So now we will do the refuge as we did last week, as we chant the visualize, description of visualization, we slowly imagine our place becoming a vast, peaceful, celestial sanctuary where all the environments that we can see and witness are all of divine quality, fit to uh, as an environment in which we invoke the presence of all the refuge object, because the analytical meditation in Buddhism, you have to analyze the refuge object, the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, and beings who go for refuge, and imagine them, see them why they are there, what causes them to be them needing and seeking refuge uh, from suffering of samsara and karma and delusions. Often they seek help, but they, all the help become mostly harm. Unfortunately, most are deluded and nobody really have wisdom. And here, person who seeks refuge as analytically, knowingly in Buddhism is actually they're seeking refuge with the wisdom and awakening through meditation and discipline and prayer and therefore feel, uh, just an, uh, engage and uh, cognitively stay in that meditative state and then invite all beings with you to do the, to do the refuge. Refuge expressed physically in prostration form, verbally in a prayer for recitation and emotionally in form of uh, compassion, pity for each other and not feel, feel stressed by each other's difficulty, but doing this as a, as a kind of a, a therapy to let go hate and anger and stress, and drop them as we bow down before Buddha, as a kind of mutual way of learning how to, how to find useful to go through the ceremony to express forgiveness to each other, pardon each other, and not blame and re react and punish and seek help to punish each other even more as samsaric deluded sentient beings do. But instead of promise to bring peace and forgiveness a chance by finding the way of peace and compassion um, in what we call Buddhism, the refuge is where people learn to uh, uh, turn to Dharma rather than turn to darkness. So with that in mind, you employ the body, your speech, mind, meditatively, in an active, creative, but very cognitively. Not just merely a kind of faith, but faith that is assisted by reason. Uh, uh, and then the reason which therefore makes oneself very intelligible to do. So with this in mind, we do the refuge uh, chanting and don't let the mind wander off. Uh, or stay dull or sink in, but stay very guided. So we'll chant that paragraph, <clears throat> Refuge as a Meditation Practice. Oh, 
In the most holy guru who embodies the qualities and deeds of the body, voice, and mind of all the Tathagata, abide in the ten directions in three times. Souls of 84,000 discourses of the Dharma, master of all noble assemblies, are in all sentient beings equal to limitless space. From this time forth, until essence of enlightenment reached, stay fastly, take refuge in the Guru and the holy master of the lineage, take refuge in blessed accomplished Buddhas, take refuge in holy teaching, take refuge in noble assemblies, Take refuge in glory, Guru and Holy Master lineage. Take refuge in best accomplished Buddhas. Take refuge in holy teaching. Take refuge in noble assembly. Take refuge in glory, Guru and Holy Master lineage. Take refuge in best accomplished Buddhas. Take refuge in holy teaching. Take refuge in noble assemblies. So we rise up and do a few more prostrations while engaging your mind and the body and heart and the visualization of everyone wholeheartedly uh, confessing. As we touch our hands on the forehead, we confess negative karma committed by the body against anyone. Um, touching at the mouth and throat, we confess any negative karma of bad mouthing, negative karma of heart and mind as we touch our heart. And we confess, we pardon all, we seek the blessings of the Buddha's holy body, speech, and mind. Imagine you multiply your body as many as atoms of the universe, and therefore gracefully do each prostration as a cognitive, mindful, uh, actualization of meditation in uh, in action. So, so we do that a few times. So we'll recite the same refuge prayer three more times, and then the conclusion part is where we sincerely uh, bring our attention in making our concern and prayers known, express our deepest sense of prayer for people and places in the world. <laughs> Uh, to to become safe in their thoughts by turning to their faith and teachings of peace and kindness and tolerance. So we, we include all beings joining us in that way. And then, we, as a result of this supplication, imagine all the enlightened beings send healing light. And that dissolves all the realities that people are stuck in as nothing has ever actually happened except in the mind. And now, since that mind has been reclaimed, woken up from the sleep, they're no longer in dreaming. And so they all woke up. 
that everything is clear and very clear and everything is empty. Nothing has happened. If it has, it's finished. Now it's completely new. So in that way the refuge dissolves everything into Buddha and the Guru and finally even the enlightened one dissolves and then it dissolves into you finally and yourself also become completely clear and luminous light that is our Buddha nature which is the first topic we talk in the first evening but we don't claim the Buddha nature unless we cultivate and that's by taking refuge by taking refuge in the triple gem then we are cultivating the Buddha nature not letting it live, uh, leave it as a dormant, but actually cultivating the Buddha nature through the refuge which we are, which we have been practicing. Uh, so the mind become very, very consciously aware of the commitment, of the guidance, uh, that teaching of the Buddha becomes a refuge. It makes us to stay safe in thoughts, our deeds, and our feelings and our language. Even those that are still yet to be completely corrected, we still are making peace with ourselves first, without blaming things out there. When people who have no refuge tend to do that, those who have refuge tend to work their own difficulties inwardly first, without reacting things outwardly, which is really benefit of refuge which is a sign of Buddha nature being cultivated. So, so for that we will do a few more refuge and then do the conclusion. I take refuge in glory, good and holy Mazalini. I take refuge in Bessa Gambi Buddhas. I take refuge in holy teaching. I take refuge in noble assembly. I take refuge in glory, good and holy Mazalini. I take refuge in Bessa Gambi Buddhas. I take refuge in holy teaching, I take refuge in noble assemblies, I take refuge in glory, good and holy master lineage, I take refuge in Besagambi Buddhas, I take refuge in holy teaching, I take refuge in noble assemblies, I take refuge in glory, good and holy master lineage, I take refuge in Besagambi Buddhas, I take refuge in holy teaching, I take refuge in noble assemblies. In the Guru and three precious gems, I bow down and take refuge. May you bless my master.
Consider that the clarity of mind is the Sangha, the empty aspect of Holy Dharma. The combination of the two is the Buddha. It's the nature which is non differentiates of the three is the Guru. For as long as possible, meditate on this. So by, by introducing this refuge uh, last week and, and by incorporating in this way, I would like to uh, emphasize that every uh, formal Buddhist meditation uh, always begins with the meditation on refuge. People think refuge is some kind of a mandatory prayer that you should do before one does any Buddhist. That's, so that's mainly culturally maybe seen correct. But most important it should be analytically. One needs to realize analytical has a meaning of cognition and reasoning. One must reason why we do the refuge. Uh, every time we do the refuge, we should feel... Oh, God, without refuge, I feel so easily sort of swayed by these extreme kind of problems. And so easy to lose the path and completely whipped away by some uh, distraction or, or influence. So easy to forget refuge. So doing the refuge at the very beginning is just re recognizing, reconnecting, renewing one's refuge. You see that some uh, religious tradition, they do their prayer five times a day or, or whatever. In, in Buddhists too, you know, they should do the refuge before every meditation. And so that's why um, um, doing the refuge from the point of view of our course uh, goes to cultivate. The first thing the person does after realizing they have Buddha nature is they learn to uh, make it be consciously cultivated. And to cultivate Buddha nature, one has to uh, reconnect with the Buddha as the refuge object and the Dharma as the teaching that makes us to uh, awaken, to stay safe. Because uh, whenever we think in terms of Dharma, how would a good Dharma person respond to this situation? It's straight away our consciousness changes, you know, then our personality, our, our individual view doesn't you know, sway us. Straight away there is kind of a kind of safe and insane and very intelligent way of resolving the issue. And then all of a sudden we realize we're entitled to do that. You know, we got, it's free to do that and you can stay safe. <laughs> Drop all the opinions, all their views and aside and you feel far more safer doing that than any kind of emotions, any kind of history, any kind of reasons that we think we could, we could take the action further type of thing. And we straight away find that we come to the to the heart rather than the head, uh, to the kindness rather than to be right, uh, to be uh, to be safe and gentle than to be aggressive, uh, to be pausing than to be reactive. So these are the tangible sign 
and, and of refuge. Person who, is, who has refuge has certain qualities that usually manifest. So this is very relevant to in today's topic, as you have the handouts there, analytical meditation on theory of karma and the law of cause and effect. So we will meditate, as, as I'm going through this, I like you to meditate, meaning I think rationally and logically, what does these things mean? Because cause and effect. Often we are not, uh, uh, we don't call it karma, but we are always thinking, what can I do to get that? What can I do to avoid that? <laughs> we are always trying to find the causes. And only if we can logically know what is the cause, uh, that is the result. Maybe materially, you know, how do you get, how do you get this bulb last long? It doesn't last two months. We want a five-year lasting bulbs. And to do that, you have to have a particular quality <laughs> in the bulb, <laughs> whatever. So we always wanted to get the cause to get a good result, whether it's your 25 years of education or strenuous training as a musical music student early in the morning, go to music lessons for all those years. We're trying to create the causes to become have a good result. So karma, law of karma, is basically intuitively in us all. It is not a kind of belief system. Even if you don't believe, it affects you. So therefore, not believing doesn't have any benefit. So you might as well start to understand what the hell is the karma? <laughs> How does this cause and effect really work? Instead of thinking it's a Buddhist or Eastern, it's not. Cause and effect is a not pronounced, but it says whatever you sow, so you will reap. You know, people, people even without hearing such religious quotes, they still, still go and cultivate sugar cane, knowing what it, what it requires. They don't try to grow sugar cane in Canberra, for instance. They know the right causes and conditions, not right. Even though you get a big land, but it's not quite right causes and conditions. So you deliberately buy a place somewhere in, in Queensland, somewhere where there's more, more, more kind of temperate and weather and all the conditions. So you can see the causes and conditions are very crucial. It's back in everybody's mind. So firstly, the uh, karma means create action. It basically means action. Because every action has a result. Every action is a cause. Action usually is immediate cause of a result, but the, uh, but the hidden cause of, of the result is not the action. It's the usually intention, yeah? It is the intention. Uh, so benefit of thinking in terms of cause and effect is, firstly, we become more mindful uh, safer, like if we have refuge. If we have, if we have refuge, uh, people usually think in terms of karma. Karmically speaking, what, what should I do with this? You know. So you st as soon as you think of terms of karma, there seems to have a humility which with you accept the something, even if it's a difficult result that you are experiencing. As soon as you understand karma, you realize if you don't accept carefully, it becomes not only a, it's not only an experiencing result, but it can create another cause. <laughs> so there's no no result that is just result. Rose result can also create karma, create causes. Even good result could become. If you react poorly, it can become bad cause. <laughs> so, but if he can uh, accept uh, carefully even negative result of some negative causes, no doubt, it can become good cause. So there is no fixed uh, thing. Uh, because of that, we, we do not see that one is inherently black or white. They are just relative. <laughs> relative. So it, it might be... Uh, yeah, some, some people have very hard childhood upbringing, but through, as a result of that, they have to learn it was really hard to be not having uh, both parents or whatever, you know, uh, or whatever. One may see that a hardship, but as a result of that, the child actually had to learn to do many things on his own without being overly dependent on, on, on both parents. So actually, in fact, they have grown to be very strong. So that shows that there is no karma that is permanent negative result and have no consequences of turning into a good cause. So benefit of thinking in terms of cause and effect is that everything is fluid. Everything is fluid and nothing is fixed. 
and and uh, and uh, and, in, and and determined by some supreme being out there. So that actually cancels out the wrong notion as something is created have a divine authorship. No, there is no such. No, there is any devil authorship. There is not a so-called evil, so-called yes, original sin that is causing negative. So it is all due to many causes and conditions. This opens our mind from danger of thinking right and wrong or good and evil to all causes and conditions. The merit of not thinking cause and effect has this danger of having this uh, view. It's good or bad, good or evil. And then the us and versus them, very dualistic. To people who don't know the uh, karma, they think, oh, if you follow this, if you follow this, you're good, you'll go to heaven. If you don't follow this, you're bad, you'll go to hell. And that kind of very dualistic, divisive uh, thing it will be promoted. But not just between religions, we're talking about us versus them. Oh, we are good, they are bad. We don't have anything to do with them. That kind of attitude. It divides people. It doesn't bring people. Those who know refuge knows how to turn around and learn, find a way to not to become a uh, divider between good and evil and very dualistic. Uh, so, uh, so therefore, those who, are, who have no refuge in Dharma uh, tend to do that. Those who have refuge in Dharma, they realize uh, that everything is dependent, relative to something. It's nothing is inherently good or bad in itself. Um, uh, so, uh, so, if a person has a, has a very difficult uh, car experiences, but if they learn to do something useful with it, it can become the turning point. Uh, but if a person is indulging in his some kind of what you call the um, uh, contaminated karma of some something very good happening in this life, and then waste it all for that and not use anything useful with that, then he can, he can be ruined by that that uh, status or or wealth or whatever it is because without realizing that uh, that 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 in itself has nothing in innately good it depends what you do with it you know and it, it, what you do with it you know like like person people like Nelson Mandela personally speaking uh, you can someone who's who's good 25 years spent in jail that must be terrible karma you know you know you can see about but how he, how many people like him went to 25 year jail <laughs> but how many turned that into a wonderful thing <laughs> it's like that so we're talking about that there being no fixed good and bad for anything in a definite time and so the merit of not thinking cause and effect tend to be very dualistic uh, so that's why uh, um, one has to become mindful of the theory of law of cause and effect and its workings. General consideration of law of karma and specific consideration of law of karma. Here in this case, firstly, the karma is certain to produce result that is similar to the cause. So whatever uh, week uh, one creates a karma, whether major or minor, physical or mental or financial or whatever it is, whatever seed we sow, like if we sow the seed of, of, uh, of, uh, of carrot, it will produce carrot. It's just question how, is, how healthy it is going to be. It will not become banana, <laughs> you know, because there's no, no similar cause in the result. Uh, so the only thing that will grow is, is uh, as a form of uh, carrot, but just question is how healthy it will be. And uh, nobody, nobody grow, nobody plant one carrot to have another one carrot. <laughs> so that will be useless. So therefore, second is it is certain that the result is always greater than the cause. So you, whatever you do, it always have far more greater number of result uh, than, than 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 the cause itself. We see lot, We see from agriculturally, we see that people grow. Uh, people put maybe maybe five kilos of of the grain or the seed as a seed and strew on the land. They don't do it to get another five kilos. They do it hopefully to fifty kilos <laughs> or more. You know, so likewise we have to know. Oh, if you become mindful and a little of karma, of oh, I'm doing this, but this will have ten times, twenty times more <laughs> effect than what I'm ignoring now. You know. 
it may look like not not a so big a thing if I do this, you know, but it will have huge consequences. So this makes us more wakeful of what we intentionally or emotionally or verbally saying or doing. If we're not mindful of karma, we don't care what, what the result is going to be. We might even think there is no result. <laughs> but result, the nature of karma is that it will have many more results than, than we think. So that's why when we, even when we do a, like an offering of lamps, or preparing the balls, or, or doing something spiritual practice, when you do it carefully, mindfully, even though it looks like feeling some water balls, you know, uh, but, uh, but actually the merit of that have huge, you know, the story of a monk who, who, had, who was born with a beautiful voice, the amazing voice of chanting people. This is not the, anything comparable any voice shows in Australia. You know? Mm. <laughs> you know? This is definitely a you know, blind audition. <laughs> because uh, nobody needs to look at the, this, uh, these monks, but his voice is just so inspiring. And uh, everybody asked the Buddha, what is the karma of this monk? He said, he offered the bell, a bell to hang on the side of the temple. When the temple finished, you know, the temple got chimes, yeah? So he, out of devotion for the person's generosity, effort, all of that, he said, I want to be part of this beautiful temple. What can I do? He offered a little bell which got hung on the side of the temple and then and the beautiful sound every now and then. Buddha said, the merit of offering one bell <laughs> to a temple out of devotion uh, gave him n not only birth as a human being, but also become a monk, but blessed with a beautiful voice. When he chant, everybody just feels so blessed. So that's the kind of karma, you know. <laughs> so, so, so next time when you when you when you offer a bell to someone <laughs> or something, you know, the karma is enormous. It, it the result is is certain to become the result is far greater than the cause, you know. So that's one example. Uncreated karma never produces effects. So, so this is good meditation. If you experience something, you. Often we think, I don't deserve this. I didn't do anything like this to anybody. Why should I experience this? We straight away jump up and some rebel. <laughs> you know? But actually, if I understand the law of karma, it's actually, we don't remember all the past things we did. We even forget things we did in this life. <laughs> So how can we not, how can we tell we didn't do this and this? So it's an inference that if you're already experiencing karma, some positive karma, you know, some people feel very fortunate. They don't know why they deserve so much and yes, yet others don't and they feel guilty, you know. <laughs> so if one understands karma, one says, oh, you know, uh, Certainly, I must have done some good that has deservingly blessed me this. Now, I must make sure I don't let this go wasted. <laughs> uh, so then one becomes more skillful in doing good things what one has. So then, the, uh, then the one is not dismissing that, that uh, you know, uh, that, uh, this, uh, that good things you have uh, uh, come from causes, you know, one, one is actually certain it must have and therefore one is even more determined to do more good with that and so therefore uh, uncre uh, uncreated karma never produces effects. So even when we have difficult experience like health or some other areas of life is not so good, but they, firstly all karma is also impermanent but at the same time it has a cause we just don't recognize, you know, we don't just recognize uh, why why we have that. And if we accept uh, knowingly, I'm sure I've done something, so I must accept this in my this life and may this exhaust all the karma like mine, then we accept the karma and we don't reject it. <laughs> we don't reject it and create another negative karma. <laughs> we accept the karma, then it purifies uh, uh, created causes because creative causes bring the result. It's like you're getting a debt collector's letter and you don't remember. You don't remember not paying it. And then and, and you say, no, I don't know this. No, 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 that's not me. And then you say, could pretty please you know, substantiate, <laughs> substantiate all the reason why. You, and then they send you like how many years back and what about and you know, so on. Then you remember, oh, <laughs> 
then one, one, one really feels <laughs> so that, you know, and the karma is very, very accurate. It doesn't make a miscalculation. <laughs> and so, so if you understand karma, something happens and you don't know what happens. And it, even though it looks like someone really after you just unfairly, you should think, even though people also say that you didn't do a thing, they're terrible. But you must say that, you mustn't say if your dharma understand. Yeah, I know, but I've created similar causes myself somewhere in past incarnation for sure. Otherwise, it will not arrive in like this. So with that, it prevents us from reaction. <laughs> it prevents us from childish reaction, punish somebody else. It makes us humble to accept uh, and then makes us to grow. And then uh, we also don't make it harder on others. So that's why if you understand uncreated karma don't produce results, we become much more humble acceptor of the karma we're experiencing. Why? We took refuge. We took refuge and one of the things we have faith, one of the things that we, we, we accept the Buddha is the faith in the law of karma. <laughs> the law of karma. Buddha doesn't reap any benefit by us believing in it, not believing in it. It's not, not that he has some kind of a, he kind of has, has a collecting some levy. <laughs> Everybody who believes karma, he gets a levy from that. It's not that. <laughs> it's not, not so much like tribute to the Buddha. It's a tribute to ourselves, you know. As soon as we remember refuge and I believe in karma, and that's the central doctrine of the teachings of the Buddha, law of karma, and so, as a result of that, it makes us safer. Because we have refuge, we're safe from reacting and childishly reacting. We become, uh, uh, in many ways, humbly accept that. And uh, instead of saying, oh, no, it's him, I didn't do a thing, I can prove I'm totally free, I'm not guilty of it. But remember, karma isn't like that. In this world, only they, they look for one cause. And it's very unfair and makes more cause of suffering than any form of justice, justice have ever. So instead of resorting to some useless, destructive, mutually destructive litigation, person who has refuge must accept the karma and then learn to uh, practice tolerance and uh, acceptance. And when you do that, why? Because you know that uncreated karma doesn't produce effects. And effects is already experienced by us, so why we can't deny that. And created action does not fail to produce effect. This is even better. Now, if you practice humility and accept, then this will not, not go astray, you know. This will not go astray, but these two will be rewarded necessarily. So, therefore, karma is the most fairest justice system there is. <laughs> it doesn't need somebody weighing you or judging you. It's you yourself, they say, Lake Melon, the mirror of karma is yourself. <laughs> yourself deeply know in your heart, you know, what to do. It's not because somebody sides you, you feel bad or somebody criticizes you feel bad worse. It's not that, not karma. <laughs> That's the mundane samsara dharma. person who understands karma, whatever hardships he does face, you know, and any, any kind of wholesome tolerance and generosity or sacrifice you have to make, it is far better you did it now when you have blessed with precious human rebirth, you have refuge, you have all the good revenues. If you cannot do in this life, you would not be fit to do that in any other, other lives. So therefore you might as well do while, while I'm fit and, fit and sound, I'm going to do this now and I wouldn't be able to, to do it anywhere now. So you don't delay, delay. <laughs> you don't put it off that you believe in this, but tonight, right now it's too inconvenient. And so one said, I have refuge in the triple gem, uh, in the, and the truthfulness of the law of cause and effect, and incontrovertibility, which means non-deceptivity. It doesn't deceive anybody. Karma doesn't deceive anybody. It is not siding one and siding against like lawyers. You know? <laughs> it is not. <laughs> All friends. Even friends are not good. When it really, friends usually do more harm because you listen to them and then you realize, realize how deluded they are or on top of your delusion. And they, out of some kind of bias to you, they try to deludedly support you. And, and it's no. But dharma is so fair and, and there's no room for mistake. You know? So with that, you have faith in the triple gem and don't 
muck around with the worldly reactions and worldly dharmic reactions. And that's why a person must act like one who has safe way of dealing the problem sanely and kindly by understanding the law of causality. So these first four points, general consideration, very general but very, very important because if you understand these four points of karma, you have an amazing way of dealing with karma. Say, let's meditate as I am speaking this. Some particular things that you have experienced that you really found it difficult to accept. Now this will not happen. If I understand this point, it will not happen from how on or near onwards. I will analytically see this in a more holistically and then instead of reacting and overreacting like childish people do, I'll look within my own heart and look at the teachings, look at my refuge and then my understanding of karma. I shall not react and overreact in the way in the past because I understand these crucial points of the law of karma. What are particular incidents, instances I could bring to my, to my mind that I could a lot be safer than I have been in the past? I definitely haven't been so fair even to myself, let alone to others, by resorting to and carrying on where the way I did. That's because I didn't have really benefit of understanding refuge and understanding karma. Now I have this clear understanding. This is indeed will make me safer in my thoughts and the words I utter, you know, things I do, things I don't. See? Now the karma is learning, helping us. The understanding of that, understanding of refuge is helping us to restrain from non-virtuous actions in thoughts and words and deeds. And then one becomes so. This is based on the understanding of theory and actually workings of the karma. And also the fifth point is projecting and completing karma, you know. Later on we will know what is what makes it projecting and completing karma. Projecting karma could be like a, a the intention could be very strong on maybe wholesome or 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 unwholesome or whatever intention. But the completing means that the action itself was not quite consummated in the way it was motivated. The motivation was genuine, maybe helping. But then the actual helping itself was jeopardized by some kind of other active action that was contradictory to the intention. So therefore the co projecting and completing karma could be exactly contradictory, you know. So there's a lot of people's life in it began so well, but it just ended in such a horrific. Or some places it began very hard, but it became a very good thing. So therefore, there are a lot of things like some uh, projecting karma is like incomplete. It is really, really good, but it doesn't quite consummate it in the way it was intended. Uh, it's something else took over, and then it was consummated by some other ways. So uh, projecting karma and completing karma can sometimes be an example of it that I say that the person, his child is born as a human being in a beautiful, loved, and much highly prized by the family and so on. But the child dies at a very young age. So that's an example of like uh, projecting karma is wholesome, but it didn't have completing karma that is wholesome. Therefore, it couldn't reach age of maturity, live as a human being, die very young. So, therefore, the completing karma uh, is, is like it, the child died so young, it, mother and the father had the only misery of having to have the child, but no joy to actually give much, to see much of him growing. And so, there is projecting karma from all sides, father, mother, as well as the child. At the same time, completing karma. So when one is not mindful, we, are, we, we, we sort of rashly do something and then we don't refer, follow it up, even if it's a virtuous one. Or rashly do something, um, uh, whatever is uh, uh, you know, uh, well-intended, and then not followed by anything similar. So mostly contradictory. So, 
So there are a lot of things people start with something and doesn't quite complete in a way. And they feel huge despair, regret and anger, resentment. And that's usually the projecting and completing karma are very contradictory. And certain and uncertain to experience. So means uh, some people experience uh, the effects of some karma they created. Other people do not experience. Maybe two people did this very identical action together, but one can experience the similar result, other don't experience it. So that, that is, of course, not the kind of deception of the karma, but rather the, the, the variation, variation of heavy or lightness of the individual karma determined by not just the um, similar action to put together, but the type of the intention, type of other things. So we're going to discuss that a little later on a separate point when we talk about completing karma. Created, uh, created and accumulated action. These two number point is number seven is created means meant intentionally. And uh, if you have intentional karma, such as love or rejoice or, or, or forgiveness or uh, loving kindness, if you, have a, if, a, if you create loving feeling towards sentient beings, uh, and then uh, and, and that loving kindness feeling is then uh, become habituated as a very loving character of the person, what we accumulated karma, then the person naturally has, has developed a propensity to have a very loving feeling towards somebody. Because, that's, that's because they have deliberately recruited these, uh, recruited and created these like altruism or loving kindness, whatever they have cultivated. Like others who have very developed a strong ill will towards a particular race for some other reason, they're racially very hateful to somebody. They intentionally hate that, that kind of people. And then as a result of that, they, they always have that kind of innate, some kind of a hate towards that. So created and accumulated action. Accumulated means the intention became uh, followed up by many, many repetitive actions. And so uh, we call propensities. The propensity become addicted. Negative ones addicted, and the positive ones merited. You know, uh, positive ones are person become very good at it. Like person who is very diligent with the helping others and sacrificing themselves. And they they are not only created the intention to help, but they have the accumulated kind of mileage or power, velocity with which they can go and help sentient beings unimpededly. Other people, they, they cultivate intention, but doesn't follow up with the action. They kind of follow up. The steam doesn't, doesn't they don't have that kind of stamina. <laughs> so the merit is very, very lacking, if you like. So that shows that uh, uh, intention is, could also, intention that is long intention. For 10 years ago, you recite bodhicitta, you've been cultivating. And then as a result of that, Long-term generate in bodhicitta intention have a have a have a lot of accumulated attitude. You always tend to think, oh, I should I lack bodhicitta? That's the problem. So you naturally will find the lack of bodhicitta rather than fault of this or fault of him or fault of them. Uh, that's the merit, you know. Whereas a person who is uh, addicted with a, due to a created habit of maybe drinking alcohol and firstly then got really addicted and then he can never get let go of drinking. So then become very addicted. So this becomes a created, becomes accumulated. Accumulated means done so many times that they don't know how to let go. They become overly dependent on it. So created and accumulated action because the person has a lot of mileage, <laughs> if you like. Like a, like a person has flown the air, airplane uh, pilot for, for, I don't know, many, many years, then he would have so many years of flown. So he's considered very experienced. <laughs> the person who had learned all the theory <laughs> of, of, of piloting and the mechanical, and this, just, he's just recently just got the job and he's, he's got not, a, not the accumulated habit or merit or experience of flying so long. So they, therefore his skill of negotiating with some difficult situation will be limited. So like that, every one of us, if you look at subjectively to yourself, in some areas of life you have really not only created, but you have kept up with that habit and therefore you have become very good at it. You can see that in people. 
they, maybe they weren't so used to doing that, but as a result of doing five or six years or seven or year, three years, you can see they really change as a result of the habit. So karma also means that which slowly built a new habit. Those who lack one and can destroy existing habit that they have reason to counteract that by the antidote. So karma has a function of, of replacing one habit by another. Why? You know, the karma is not a bygone conclusion. It is subject to change. And because it, it, not every karma is created and has a result, but even resultant create, created causes also can create another cause. Because of that, we are not so uh, kind of uh, fatalistic, whether it's right or wrong type of thing. You know, if, if, if killing was terrible and go to hell, you know, like Angulimala would have gone to hell because he can become, become a monk and become a harad, you know. Even though it's said that killing is have such a heavy karma, just killing one is heavy karma to go in hell. But he killed 99 people, but, you know, when, <laughs> he, he became an arad before he go to hell. I don't know whether they permit any arad in hell or not. <laughs> I don't think they will. They say, oh, you're arad, go away, you're you, you've done your job. <laughs> so they wouldn't <laughs> let in. <laughs> so that shows that you can actually exhaust karma, um, karma that you think is terrible, if your accumulated action is so powerful like a merit to counteract whatever other heavy causes. Mm. So, and would be, would, would be experience action. Yeah, would experience... Uh, uh, would be experiential action when the person not only do the things in action but also they themselves will experience. So those are general consideration of karma. Now the specific consideration of karma, I'll go a bit quickly there, here because uh, uh, this is more specifically. There are all actions when we are analytically or mindful. There are four factors. First is the object, uh, object or to whom or for whom or with whom, against whom, you might create an action, whether it's intent, mental, or verbal, or physical, yeah? So, uh, so according to who it is, by, 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 by the nature of your relationship, the, the object has a particular power by which the karma is either weak or powerful. So if we do something wonderful, good deeds, even small things, but good things, towards our parents, it's considered to be very positive karma. Likewise, if we do the smallest thing, like if we gave a, na a nasty look to our parent, it's considered to be w w more terrible karma than giving a nasty look to a bird. <laughs> bird probably wouldn't notice anywhere. They're very blissful creatures. <laughs> they wear specks not to see such things. <laughs> so... It's not that someone is high class, someone is low class. The emotional relationship is such that if you, if you show, do say something nice to your loved ones, like mother, it, it has huge merit to them. Likewise, if you do something little harmful to them, it has a very heavy karma. So the factors. And then again, also humans and animals and insects. So you, there, there's some kind of hierarchy uh, because of the big life and small life and all that. Um, Another is the intention. The, out of the intention, if it's negative, uh, desire, hatred, and ignorance, the desire, hatred, and ignorance, each of these three intentions have variable results, you know, um, uh, very particular results. So that's in, in relation to negative. But if you, uh, in terms of uh, uh, wholesome deeds, Instead of desire, contentment. Instead of hatred, goodwill. Instead of ignorance, wisdom. Uh, then, uh, so if, uh, if you wholesome karma with these three intentions, uh, will, uh, will make it very wholesome because of the intention. Now, for instance, if you have a lot of contentment towards your parents, oh, I'm so blessed for, to the parents that I have. You know? It's far more meritorious content, uh, contentment then any, your wealth, your wealth, contentment, your wealth is secondary. If you don't have contentment with your parents, you know, it's far more superior, uh, venerable 
to have contentment with your parents. Now, to have no contentment with your parents is very, very illogical. Firstly, we are already healthy and standing in the world, <laughs> and yet we are not content. They've done the parental job pretty fittingly. <laughs> we are on our feet, we are 30, 40, 50 years, and we have, we have a job or we have something to do, and they have done the job, basically. So to not have contentment with that would be very heavy karma. <laughs> But to be very grateful towards them, you know, very content with them, is very wholesome karma by the holiness of the parental kindness. <laughs> so this is the variation. But if you're not content with some, uh, some person, you travel in two weeks, it doesn't matter. And after that, you will both go away. So you can have arguments during that. And after that, you never see, see them again. And it doesn't so, so matter, you know. But we're talking about variation of the nature of the uh, people and their relationship. Uh, and so likewise, if you show loving kindness to your parents, it's far better than hatred. If you show hatred towards them, it's very heavy karma. Heavy karma. If you show some hatred towards other things a little bit, but to showing hatred to ang parents is very heavy karma. Likewise, if you do lovingly smallest things towards parents, it's much more wholesome karma because of the whole in the importance of the uh, object. Another is the application. Application is uh, doing the thing directly or indirectly. Because of your respect to your parents, you, you ask others to do, you make others to do, you influence your younger brothers to do, or nieces, nephews to do, honor their parents and so forth. That also is application. In the end, in the end your good intention, respect to your parents, you're doing it. Uh, or some people, Terrible people, one or two in a million, they hire people to harm their parents. <laughs> so they didn't do it, but they, ha they hire, hire some people to do it. So that kind of heavy, very heavy karma. Even they didn't do, do it directly, the fact that they caused somebody to do it, it's a very, very heavy karma. It's called patricide. <laughs> Matricide is one of the five heinous karma. Killing parents is considered to be the most unforgivable evil doing, you know. So even if one didn't do it directly, just one do it to, through somebody, through even poisoning or whatever it is, so negative karma. <laughs> and application. Now the fourth one is completion. Uh, completion is, uh, so if any action you, con you create has have all these four things complete, four things complete, which means every action you go to instigate, you say you if you look after your parents and you may even take time off you full time to part time so that you can be your with your parents and do the, all the things you do and even help other people to do with that and then you feel totally satisfied to make sure you can see them through that until their last breath you did all your thing you have so much rich respect satisfaction and regretless Regretlessness. So that is a very wholesome karma. So wholesome karma. Whereas a person who is doing something non-virtuous against somebody, like parents, then uh, like uh, harming them or doing something, saying something, arguing, and then you think you won and they, they have to keep their mouth shut, that kind of thing, then you think you are satisfied because you won type of thing, then it's very heavy karma because it has all the four components, the object, intention, application, and completion. So often some karmas don't have all the four things, yeah? Intention and object, but no application and completion, yeah? So that is where makes, makes karma, throwing karma negative, maybe positive, but completing karma, not uh, positive, but negative. Because of the mismatch of the, all the causes conditions. It's just like you had all the right, right thing you did in the springtime when you plow the soil and everything, but summertime weeding didn't occur. <laughs> As a result of that, your crops got destroyed and, and they, you yielded very little, little return, you know. It's like that. So, but if you look after the whole, uh, throughout the whole time mindfully and you went through everything, weather and everything permitting, you did all like a good discipline kind of harm, then you have a good, good yield uh, uh, when, you, when you have the harvest. It's like that, isn't it? So a little bit of, sort of the farmers have to be very disciplined, you know. Farmers have to be, they said they can't choose a date. They have to do it, you know. <laughs> they can't say, I'll do it next where today I don't feel like, you know. Just missing one night could, could lose the whole crops. 
So that's why when the object, intention, application, completion, when all these four factors are complete, then karma becomes very complete, whether it's wholesome or not. Like th those of us who are here, for instance, we are all born with a blessed, precious human rebirth. We could have been born, karmically speaking, if we haven't created the causes, we could have been easily born as a, not even as a human being, you know, and just as a wild animal, and who is completely at the mercy of the people and, and the weather and elements, you know. And if they're born as a kangaroo in Canberra, you're very unlucky. They're going to call you, and that's it. Yeah, that's, yeah you have no say. As, as, as simple as that. You may look beautiful, you may be photographed by the Japanese and tourists, but the, God, the local people want you have too much. Too much. <laughs> that's, that's karma. So this is very, very unfortunate, you know. One moment they are very famous, they are national symbol, another moment they are being culled. The, car, the kind of, they don't have say, they don't have power, they don't have rights, they, they have few people who wanted to serve them, uh, protect them, but they are minority, they are usually even arrested for doing that. <laughs> so that's the kind of karma, we can, it's a kind of situation. But we are blessed with human rebirth and with precious rebirth, with intent to follow Dharma, meet Dharma. All of these things are not accident. They had object, they have intention, they are various things we did. They all have merited these things. So we must, when we understand karma, we should rejoice. Rejoice our particular situations and make very positive comparison, comparison to others and then feel really satisfied and not feel disconnected or discontented with life and in particular seeing things in life. In comparison, all this, my karma isn't really too bad. All I need to do is rejoice this and make good use of this and don't dwell on things what I don't have to be distracted by. When you start doing that, then what you do, the precious human rebirth, particularly the most suitable form of re rebirth that has a Buddha nature, cultivatable, when you have refuge, when you really understand law of karma and refuge, then your Buddha nature is not in the jar. It's already in, this, in the fertile soil. It has already germinating and water is, uh, is reaching there and, and it's now growing. Now to, to make sure that the seed not only grows but protected from frosts and other dangerous things and you need to therefore take care of the karma one creates. So that's why here we're going to go through the light and heavy uh, variable karma briefly. Uh, um, whatever we do, there are a number of factors, not just what we did, but number of factors that can determine the heavy or lightness of and uh, some heavy and lightness could be determined by the intention. This intention is hatred. Even small act could be very, very harmful. If intention is altruism, you know, even intention of altruism, you know, the, in, the benefit is enormous, like the enlightenment of Shakyamuni Buddha. His main intention to leave palace and live life of Bodhisattva is totally for the benefit of others. So the intention is good, and then uh, whatever you use doing small things, it doesn't really matter, the intention. Some is by action. Some is by action. The action itself, like say, uh, uh, like a group of people killing something, or a group of people rescuing something. Even though if you did one person rescue or uh, rescue injured an animal, or four people rescued a uh, injured enemy, actually four people working together rescuing an animal is more meritorious. <laughs> uh, and uh, of course, one person rescuing is not unmeritorious, is but still meritorious. But the fact that they all took part in the good, <laughs> then it's more meritorious. Likewise, if the action negative karma joined together by four people, five people, it's most destructive to the individuals. They don't only carry that negative karma of themselves, but facts they have allied with them, five others, four others. <clears throat> so that's why when you do good deeds, heaviness and lightness, that's why Sangha doing prayer together <clears throat> is more meritorious than oneself on one's own. So that's why they always make mandatory to, and the Buddhist 
uh, monastics, they should always at least come twice a month, <coughs> minimum, to attend some prayers and ceremonies and confession and and forgiveness and empowerments and so on. They do this. They get the opportunity to take, take good deeds with a collective number of good people. <coughs> Another heavy enlightenment is also determined by the repetition and the number. If you do one thing, they only got one wrong result. You know, if you just sow one seed in your big plate of rice, they will, they, then the rest of the place wouldn't grow. <laughs> so you have to basically, you know, in the rice field, when the, in the Indonesia or Nepal, you can see this all the hundreds of people all wearing little things and just just strewed onto the whole field. Because more people are still planting those rice in those three days, it will be done by the end of the week. <laughs> but if it's one person doing it, it takes ages, may not even do it. So, number, you know, number of people, like, like you see sometimes, that sometimes the ants are trying to pull some little piece of food or piece of breadcrumbs, but he can't quite do it. You can see, you can see, all of a sudden another one comes along. They 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 pull a little bit. A third one comes. They took it with no problem. See, <laughs> so good deeds doing together with people. So don't always think of me alone. I will do it myself. It's my karma, my merit. Being able to do together. That's why we visualize everybody doing refuge together. It's very very important because intentionally we include everybody doing together. And we don't do it thinking, oh, myself, only five of us. No, nothing to do with everyone. And then it's more meritorious. And so the repetition and the number. And uh, then if one creates negative karma by ignoring time and place, and sometimes the, the, the certain negative karma, some things one shouldn't do at certain places. Uh, like people, people are not meant to smoke in public places, you know. <laughs> these days, you know, these days it's like only last 15 years things change, you know. When I first came to Canberra, it wasn't like that. <laughs> and now does everybody knows where they can't smoke <laughs> and, and uh, when they can't smoke maybe. <laughs> and when they can't smoke and how many number? <laughs> they can smoke but they can just... <laughs> In the in the past, the, the director sits in front of everybody. Goes, <sighs> <laughs> now there's no more. No, even director have to go to the back door. <laughs> so that shows that uh, people are learning. People are learning that what they do, where and how and when is some are proper places, some are improper time. And, and if you ignore the uh, un unsuitable time or place, then it has a very heavy karma because you deliberately ignore it. So that's why there are, there are people say, oh, today's full moon, oh, today's new moon, oh, today's my such and such great master's anniversary, oh, I mustn't ignore this, I must do meditate. Oh, and doing this, everybody become more mindful, you know? <laughs> so everybody feels, uh, every time something is always guiding them. There is a time where everybody meditate, everybody take uh, precepts or go to meditation retreat, uh, uh, and then it is, I also should take part in that. People do that. And because they don't ignore the holiness of time or anniversary of parents or whatever it is, doing those is very, very good. Uh, people who do that. I know in, uh, in Singapore years ago, you know, people are very busy, everybody is very, very important. Uh, the people say, oh, today is my mother's anniversary, I'm taking a half day leave. It's so nice. <laughs> so nice to, nice people remember their mother but died five years ago and, and go half day to the temple and offer lamps and do prayers. And they wear a particular band to remember that. And that just that kind of thing slowly builds on skillfulness of merit and timeliness and when and, 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 and so and with whom and, and so forth. So, uh, yeah, if that's, that's really consideration. And then uh, some uh, wrong actions, like negative karma, like wrong action, like people sacrifice animals in the name of God. You know, some people do that in, in some lot of animistic cultures. 
uh, in, in various parts of the world. Uh, they think their god will be pleased if you drew hot blood <laughs> onto their statues. Well, it's really, you know, such a wrong views. They have no no refuge there, no refuge there. So then, then the karma is very heavy, but they are, they don't know this. They don't know this. So, and then another is heavy or light karma by candidate. Candidate means individual, Indigi individuals who have taken vows, uh, uh, who have precepts, who have who have a who have a particular responsibility to each other, uh, and so if if the responsibility uh, is honored, then by those candidates to each candidate, then the merit is far bigger, you know, far bigger. Like like children uh, showing their regular. Uh, kindness and respect to parents is far more powerful karma uh, than to showing to strangers. It doesn't mean showing to strangers is useless, it's still good. Uh, likewise, a person who has taken precepts to practice bodhicitta, for instance, and if they go and lose temper and do all sorts of harmful things, then the, then the karma, even smallest things they do, become very, very destructive and heavy and become toxic. If somebody, somebody who's, who, who hasn't done anything like that, you know, say, say if a good is done, uh, they say a monk or nun, fully ordained one, if they do good deeds, everybody, the merit with them is far greater because of their candidate, because they have the moral authority or some kind of seniority and a knowledge. But if the opposite is done by them, then, then of course more harm and damage will be caused by the nature of candidates. Uh, like, likewise, people with a similar apt, uh, candidate, uh, four do together, it's even more, more uh, meritorious. They say, I would really like to invite four sanghas. <laughs> I really want to invite four monks. Could you please spare four monks next Monday? <laughs> Can please send four monks to my home? <laughs> the three is not quite enough. <laughs> so they always say, oh, we, we invite four monks. <laughs> so they always try very hard to get four monks. <laughs> it's considered to be sort of minimum, minimum thing they invite, you know. Because the, because the Sangha is very highly revered and is more the merrier. <laughs> and so on. And then another is by object. Uh, uh, my object is uh, someone whose objects you respect, others your objects of pity, others your com objects of repet, uh, sort of, cap uh, sort of uh, rivalry. Depending to what karma you create, and with what object, then it also could be uh, uh, the, the, the weight of the karma is, uh, is heavy or light. So that's, that's in relation to number of factors. Another is the result. Now the result is the, um, the ripened result, which is the, um, the ripened result is the actual what you uh, what you are uh, experiencing. Yeah, ripened result is your experience, and then experiential result is uh, experiential result is uh, both ripened and experiential result is concordant with the cause. If the uh, ripened result of short-lived, if a person experiences a lot of illness, a lot of sickness, uh, and die young, that's a ripened result of having caused such experience to others before. So they will experience concordant ripened experience of short life, many illnesses. But one who has saved life and so on in the past, then the ripened result will be healthy, strong, and fitness. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, another is habitual ripened result, habitual result. Some are habitually always like to kill. Some are habitually always want to save lives. So these are also concordant with what they did in the habits. And the third is the possessive. Possessive is sometimes called environmental as well. Uh, possessive has a meaning kind of, kind of environment is like that. You can't, you are not exceptionally bad. That's for the environment. You are brought up in an environment, you can just possess by that and you don't have an ability to, to disown it because you're completely influenced by the culture in which you are brought up. So that's a possessive karma. So what we have got here, list of the uh, uh, thing down here, is understanding the, mm, the mindfulness of cause and effect. 
these two columns we have, cause and effect, cause, effect. It's good to just look at this briefly. If a person who, who, gives, who have given care to others, like parents and elderly and someone who ever are deserving, and, the, and if they did that on the Monday, if they did that week, they actually feel happy. <laughs> it's amazing. The effect of caregiving, they're happy. And the, and the opposite is if they abandon them, if they abandon them instead of caregiving, they feel lonely <laughs> themselves. They feel guilty and lonely. And likewise, if you a person who's, who have spoken kind words today, and they feel really confident, they feel really good about it. <laughs> but instead, if they've been, they spoke harsh words to somebody in that very day, and, and they feel very insecure. They feel really bad because this, it's so destructive what they spoke, and they f themselves feel insecure by that. Likewise, if you practice goodwill to somebody, you feel loved. You feel loved by others. You don't feel this devoid of love from others if, you're, if you have goodwill towards others. But instead, if you have ill will towards somebody, then, then you have some anxiety. You just don't know why. You have too much anxiety and you just don't know how to settle mind well. You, because in the past or in the, re in the morning or afternoon, you, you had so much ill will and then and subsequently you got a lot of anxiety. Likewise, if you've been violent and then, like we, I was saying before, if a person who has been violent in the early in their life or to somebody and they will quickly contract illness <coughs> and short, experience short life. Whereas if we've been gentle with living beings, you know, then healthy and long life. If a person who has stolen something, even he really robbed the bank this afternoon very successfully, nobody found him, he will feel so poor still. <laughs> he doesn't act like he, has, he is richer than th this morning. <laughs> He's actually destitute of security. He is he's feeling insecure, unsafe wherever he is. He feels devoid of security. It's instant karma, basically, we're talking about. And whereas the person who has practiced giving in the morning or the end of the day, they feel abundant. They feel so good. <laughs> they feel wealthy. They feel abundant. And the person who slandered somebody, the person who slandered somebody, they only experience disharmony wherever they go. They only find disharmony chases them. Wherever they go, they are disharmony because they... And whereas the person who has practiced mediation, instead of causing more division between departing, you know, rival parties, but you try to create uh, mediation, then the person is always harmonious with everyone. He doesn't have any, anyone who doesn't dislike him or because, he, because he's, he's such a peacemaker. He's a peacemaker to everyone. Likewise, if you have sympathy towards somebody, you feel very comfortable. <laughs> you show sympathy to somebody, but if you have ill will towards somebody, you feel sad and depressed. You think it's them, you think they did some terrible thing. As a result of that, instead of whatever they did, you don't know what's the effect, but for some reason one is very miserable. <laughs> so the effect is, <laughs> effect comes into the one who creates the cause. You don't have to think it's come from others. No, one self is doing the cause. One who's contented will have a lot of gratitude. <laughs> So if you have been contented this morning or this afternoon about your work, about these various things, and you will have a lot of gratitude through the rest of the day. It's just, and, and that can tr um, almost like uh, insulate you from anything happens around you. It doesn't have the capacity to offend and harm you because you, you're protected. You are shielded by the refuge of Dharma. <laughs> we mean by refuge. Then now this is real refuge, functional refuge. It's not the Buddha's hand covering you. <laughs> It's not all the scriptures wrapped around you that is protection. It's not all these amulets hanging all over your ears and mind. <laughs> but your mind is very, very secure. Yes, if you are greedy, you feel really discontented. Whatever you have is not, you can't even see them. You want something so bad, you are, the greed is so debilitating, the person is never contented. So, easy. Well, whereas a person who is compassionate and he's really loving, you know, when you are compassionate, everybody loves you. Everybody loves you, and you don't even know why. Because you, you, when you are kind to others, it naturally, naturally incites love from others. And instead, if you are malice, if you are really ill will, and you have that, then they say, you know, I mean, this is deformity, it doesn't mean instantly. 
<laughs> maybe there is an instrument. Maybe the person's face shows pale and slowly become deformed. But generally, say people are born deformed, it's because they practice malice in the past life. So this is this. here. I have put quite a bit here, like praising. Person who prays others, speak kindly of others. They have fear. They fear nobody. Fear nobody. And and scorning. A person who has scorned other people, or spitefully spoken other people, they feel rejected by everyone. They feel rejected. They don't feel unwanted by anybody. Like a person who's practiced right speech in the past, they're blessed with the right voice. Or even they just offer a bell, they get a good, good speech. <laughs> so, you know, person instead who've been bad mouth, they're born deaf, dumb, and speech defect. And they can't speak. They can't, uh, um, they stutter, and they have very difficult, very, very fundamental defects. And person who's practiced giving, very optimistic. They always, always find a way to find something to help each other. Whereas a person who's not very generous, always negative. Oh, no, 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 that can't happen, this can't happen. Very negative, always very dissuasive. People who are generous, they make many things possible. <laughs> very, 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 very calmly, so manifestly. And people who, take, who, who only take from things others never give, yeah, they're very pessimistic, you know. They only take, 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 and they have very little, nothing is coming from them that gives hope. And person who is very critical of other people, they feel very insecure. You know, they criticize other people and they themselves feel very insecure. And because they made too much enemies, I suppose, and as a result of that, who, there will, there will be nothing good will come from true world. And if you instead endorse and support other people, you feel supported wherever you go. You never find supporters. Everybody understands you. And if you practice tolerance, you're blessed with beauty and respect, they say. Some people are respected so much. Other people are so beautiful or whatever, whatever they're through their deeds or whatever. It's because they practice a lot of tolerance. Nagarjuna says, you know, that tolerance gives beauty. You know, tolerance gives beauty and height, they say. Intolerance brings deformity and 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 born as a dwarf, <laughs> very short body. Intolerance, <laughs> intolerance brings yeah, ugly and disowned. Discipline brings confidence, and undiscipline brings fearful and insecure. Morality, respect. Immorality, careless and disregard. Humility, good body. There's a good body is a karma of. Uh, practicing morality in the past. Arrogance, physical disability. Born with fundamental physical disability. We're talking about very, very severe disability. We're not talking about aging and then and having certain parts of the body becoming. Uh, and then diligence brings a lot of success. Whatever you do, you will succeed because you have diligence. And laziness, failure. A result. <laughs> Cause is laziness, result is failure. <laughs> simple, simple as that. Uh, good speech, good teeth. <laughs> maybe, maybe you can't change this life, <laughs> but you want a good teeth next life. <laughs> I'm not talking about being a dentist, you know. Dentist doesn't. Dentist must be strange karma, and I always have to look at people's mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Must be pretty interesting come. <laughs> Fixing other people's teeth and smell the mouth. <laughs> no wonder why they're so expensive. <laughs> idle gossip, bad teeth. <laughs> but people who practice idle gossip, no good teeth. Bad teeth is bad. Faith, concentration. Doubt, distraction. Treating well, supported. Mistreatment, unsupported. Right view, clarity. Wrong view, confusion. Concentration, calmness. Even today, say, if you're during the day, you've been calm, calm you've been concentrated, you've been meditated, the rest of the day is very calming and peaceful. But instead, if you've been very agitated, you didn't practice meditation, then your mind is very stressed and anxiety written. It's just, it's just like what is the cause like, the result is similar. Faith gives mindfulness. Doubt brings indecision. Joy brings love. Hate brings sadness. Helping others brings friends. Harming others makes many enemies. 
These are just direct cause and effect. Direct cause and effect doesn't have to think in relation to one to another, another life, yeah? So, with this being the case, now we have the rest of the text here goes to more uh, specific mindfulness cause and effect of 10 virtues and 10 non-virtuous deeds. This is a, yeah? So, I just want to ask, with uh, criticizing and slandering, can, is there a distinction between doing that and, and speaking out against suffering? Like if we say, oh, Tony Abbott is not nice, the way he treats refugees, he does not show compassion, is that slander? Um, base, no, no, the, see, the, the object is Tony Abbott. <laughs> So he's a public figure, and he's got a lot of lot of admirers for what good or bad reason we don't know. So it will ha it will just criticizing and Tony Abbott will have many effect effect to not just Tony Abbott but lots of people. So from the object point of view, probably is a is the one you should we should learn to treat a bit more carefully than anybody else. But from the intention point of view, say it's a very really big issue that he's got a, such a rigid kind of un giving kind of policy which is quite un-Australian and un, 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 un uh, first world country, then its subject can definitely rise and say. So intention, if the intention is out of not about political kind of bias against, but just genuinely uh, over the issue, so then the intention, uh, it's mainly the intention. And then it's a daily question is just not just criticizing and slandering, but saying something that is really constructive that actually can change the mind of people or policy that actually can have some positive effect rather than just slandering him. Slandering for the sake of slandering is a negative karma, uh, even for the sake of others. But if speaking with the intent with which one skillfully can cause some good results, <laughs> you know, to make worthy for oneself to stand up and say that uh, for the goodness of many, but skillfully, not just to make him look bad, uh, as we are more courageous, you know, because we are able to stand up. Uh, where others dare not to do type of thing, thinking I can do it because I don't want, don't mind my status of my future. And that kind of pride, if it's pride is more involved because against a public figure, then that could hijack the very cause of it. <laughs> so this is what we're talking about, not just the object, but also the intention. And then the action, the manner, the manner which you, you're going to solicit, you're going to voice your concern, whether that's actually produced some positive effect or it only only made it you know more counter counterproductive and didn't yield any benefit, and you also wish oh, oh what a waste, and you have no satisfaction, you actually feel regret what I've done you know now you know and next day you lose your job <laughs> because because such people can do that you know <laughs> such people can do that you know they they can appoint you so put put it Australia as a sort of ambassador to Ukraine or something if they like you <laughs> if you, they don't like you they can call you next day <laughs> so so therefore they are they're not a sort of ignorable object <laughs> So because of that, the object is a, see, by virtue of the object, because of such a public figure, um, what we say and what we do, unless we are very skillful, it will be only more harmful than benefit. Uh, but we are very skillful and uh, very, 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 uh, um, uh, and, uh, and, uh, very, very good motivated, then uh, you might even feel satisfied. Maybe... In the, it took first six years he didn't do anything, but towards second year starting to do some changes. And maybe then, then we know that it has been not fruitless effort, because it can't be fruitless effort. Every effort has a good fruit. Uh, so we must have faith. You know? So the satisfaction level may, may or may not be. Uh, this is what throwing karma may be very good. With strong intention, you know, exactly knowing who the problem is and so on. But that completion may be quite, uh, quite a different thing, you know. So that's that's due to many, many, many factors. Here, for instance, when we go through, I won't go through all the examples, but uh, for instance, if you look at the first one, the killing. Uh, if the for killing sentient being for meat, or or fur or bone. Uh, or for or 
or, or just markmanship, you know, say, oh, I'm, I'm a good hunter, look at this. <laughs> so you could see that but killing could be motivated either by desire, uh, so that's all of those above is desire, meat, you know, fur or skin or uh, markmanship, and those things are all due to desire. Killing out of aggression would could be just like just like you see a you know animal killing a car in a garden and you shoot it because you you angry that it destroy your field and and you the, both desire and aggression is involved so sometimes the, the, the afflictions are single some are some are dual others are triple so killing animals who came in your field you killing is not only desire but also hatred. But if you go out into the bush to kill animal because you want want their skin or something, then it's a desire only. You actually don't have particular hatred to that animal. <laughs> so the karma could could be a little lighter or heavier depending whether whether it's dual affliction or triple affliction or single affliction. And then those who go and kill animal thinking it's some sacrifice, delighting the God. It's like ignorance, out of ignorance. So you can kill out of desire, out of hatred, out of ignorance, yeah? So, so that's like example of non-virtue, yeah? And the result of these three, uh, R-E-A-P, I wrote this, R is a uh, ripened, meaning ripened is uh, um, uh, that actually... Um, Ripen result. It's just your 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 life is affected by that what you did. Uh, usually, it's past life's karma, or maybe past uh, ten years karma ripening. Uh, say one who hunted animal for the first five years, he never had any ripened result. <laughs> he, he had a lot of skins, <laughs> he had a lot of bones, or whatever he had. But after 10 years, then he broke his leg. <laughs> oh, he had a terrible accident. That's exactly, yeah, yeah. Because and slowly, small karma, losing a leg is not a really... But nevertheless, it's a, it's a ripened form of the act of killing can ripen a result of some trage- physical ill health tragedy, either by accident or by uh, some other, um, even food poisoning, one, one contract illness. Some become very sick. Usually, a result of a ripen result of killing, oh, and also a ripen result of short life. Then, person will know even if it doesn't go go for a sick, but will die quickly, die sort of very shortly. No, no illness, just dissolved, just disappeared that night. Just didn't wake up next morning. <laughs> oh, went to the party, never came home. He did try, but never got home. <laughs> got stopped on the roadside, <laughs> and so short life. Or oh, some people are born in arid land. They say if they have killed animals, uh, be, killing a lot of killing in the past lives, due to ag- ignorance, like animal sacrifice, one will be born in arid land, very very desertly. One has to live there. So what is this? The P means possessive karma. E means experiential karma. Experience short life. P means possessive karma. You can't. You're stuck. You're stuck in that land environment. You just don't know how to get out of that land. You know, it's people. People wish to go, but they don't know how to go. That's all they have. That's the only place they've known. They're stuck. Possessive karma. Now, I didn't want to be totally negative, so let's look at the positive. <laughs> if a person abstains the killing, yeah, abstain the non-virtue of killing, then instead they save lives, yeah. So, if they save life, save life of other beings, rescue injured beings, or give them medication, or give them hope to recover, and so on, as a result, that person will be born very healthy. Hardly get any sick, you know. And uh, not only healthy, but live very long. But very radiant, very healthy, and has a benefit. Some people are healthy, but no benefit to other people. Some people are healthy, but and not on top of that, they're very beneficial. They can do many, many virtuous things, because because the because the power or merit that that body brings is is enormous. So that's why the uh, and not only they live long, but the, what they do is good. What only not only they, what they do is good, they 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 give radiance and hope in other people's lives. So that's like so mindful of this in a, in terms of analytical meditation. We have to therefore mindful. Oh, what I'm doing with this creature, even like a little, little ants in, on your 
in, in your room, you know, it's a very good to be mindful. How can I best uh, uh, deal with this, you know? Because is it because desire I'm, I'm doing this or is it because I'm angry with this, angry in your table or your room? <laughs> the, the ant might think it's theirs. <laughs> You know, so 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 it's a very powerful indicator of our whether how much we understand karma. You know, intentionally do we do we become more a little bit more careful than normal people? Normal people straight away bring some. Psh, oh, they got a lot of bug killers, and and they think it's nothing. It's just normal to. Psh. <laughs> oh, be, oh, be become mindful a little bit. Is is there a little bit more? Safer way to do this. <laughs> I have refuge. <laughs> I'm not supposed to kill any Indian beings, particularly just just because I'm attached to my table <laughs> or oh, my little honey jar. <laughs> maybe maybe you can just give that honey jar to them. <laughs> but maybe maybe you can let all the ants go into the honey jar and then slowly close the jar and put it nicely somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> they can live there for as long as. <laughs> so it's just like that, you know. One becomes mindful of you know, analytical, you know. Analytical meditation, Buddhist teaching is very powerful, isn't it? It changes people's. It's all of a sudden. I I, I got a letter in, in many years ago when uh, when, when I was a novice uh, in Nepal. And this is an Australian man, first Australian man, who become a Buddhist monk. And he said, when he stopped in Singapore and he was allowed to stay in a Buddhist family, and uh, this was really devout Chinese Buddhist family, they were pure vegetarian and they wouldn't harm an ant. Even though a place like Singapore is very, a lot of creatures. But this guy was, was, was putting food for the rats uh, so that they can feed on and not killing an ant. And uh, he was so careful. And this monk uh, come to Nepal and he said, I've never seen people can be so kind. And uh, he was so moved uh, by the people's carefulness, how they behave in front of helpless creatures and what, what, what kindness meant. And the kind being kind to parents and also, of course, of course, very important, but being just kind to helpless sentient being is a very powerful revealer of uh, meditation of the person's understanding of the first uh, precepts of not killing, you know. Uh, and intentionally not killing, you know. There's a lot of accidental killing, unintentional killing, so most people's life cannot escape that, unfortunately. But he was talking about how they do that every full moon and new moon. They go to the temple and they take take the five precepts because otherwise their everyday life is just not possible. And uh, even though they have no intention to kill any being, but the nature of their work or the road or whatever it is, it's just not possible to avoid. But uh, but once uh, every fortnight, they all go to the temple, take the five precepts, stay in the temple combine, and then they don't go home and do a meditation. And when when he saw that, that's that was a very very moving kind of training how people 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 uh, gone that way. So I will not go through the rest of the ten, but I will give you an exhaustive list there. Now I'm going to turn to the last page, uh, page three. If you understand the law of karma and we become mindful, uh, which is the very, very uh, beneficial thing, is then we mindful to adopt virtue and drop the non-virtue, isn't it? And so for this, uh, one needs to know conviction to adopt virtue and conviction to drop non-virtue. And to be able to do that, first of all, as a formal Buddhist practice, one prays to the triple gem one, every day. One daily practice, take refuge in the triple gem. That's what we do. And then resolve to purify negative habits, negative habits that we have in the past. Neg purify means drop negative habits, if possible. So slowly, slowly, maybe once a, once a fortnight, full moons, new moon, one takes the precepts and stay in safe grounds, meditation and prayer and so on. So slowly adopting the wholesome ways to resolve to purify negative habits, uh, purify negative habits, and uh, uh, and uh, wholesome and and resolve to practice wholesome deeds by taking the uh, precepts, like five the five precepts or eight precepts for the for the duration of 
usually 24 hours. That's exactly what we're talking about. And grow up to embrace the positive deeds. One actually makes a vow. One actually takes the precepts. You can do that yourself and read the prayers and then stay in the place uh, and draw up a little, little uh, schedule for yourself like we do in the retreats and then abide by the schedule and do those practices. And uh, so the, the adopt authentic Dharma practice to bring changes. Because if you don't have Dharma practice, you can't really bring changes. So try to do the once uh, fortnightly, usually full moon and new moon, uh, if not by group organizing, just try to organize a group, you know. Not always let leave somebody else to organize. Just maybe, maybe one of one can say, let's do this, this, this full moon or this new moon or, or whatever. And then l learn to help each other to remove the hindrances to purify, to bring the changes, karmically speaking. So what is that? That is purifying the negative, kar negative karma through four powers. Uh, so that's really the main practice of the, having understood the law of karma, uh, purifying negative karma is positive karma. And so therefore first is, it has four powers. First is power reliance, and refuge in the triple gem. You first take refuge in the triple gem. That's what we did, the prayer we did. You do the refuge, whether you do the prostration or not, do at least three refuge prayers. That one is longer one. Uh, shorter one you can do also, if the time doesn't permit. But always learn to do short confession each day, each day. This is shorter, so shortest one we are going through. And uh, feel, reflect uh, uh, briefly, as to what are the things I've done or said or thought that are not really proper uh, within the last 24 hours, particularly. Um, if one hasn't practiced last 24 hours, then it has to include last 48 hours and so on. But if one has done a practice each day, that's the whole the good thing about it, that you're able to review yourself and do these practices each, each day. So part of deep regret is a very, very powerful to make us not to delay anymore, but to do, the, do this confession prayer. And uh, so the top, why it's so powerful, it doesn't want you to delay or uh, excuses and, and ignore. And so third power, power to resolve, to remedy uh, and restrain from that. And uh, so for, for that, what do you do? Accept prescribed instructions, you know. Uh, say for instance, Take the vow for 24 hours. Uh, from now until sunrise tomorrow, I'll uh, observe these uh, uh, five abstentions plus three additional precepts uh, and stay in the temple grounds or room where we can do this reading and meditation prayer uh, or do just simple some other things but not go out seeking something, craving something like this and stay there, prescribe practice, something like that. And then do during this time you are in the confinement of your place, then do the recitation of confession prayers. Either the 35 Buddha's confession prayer or the Vajrasattva meditation. Uh, or the or or also prostration. That's what we're talking about, prostration. And do the creative visualization of cleansing the practices. So if you are not familiar, we are we have a one Vajrasattva empowerment coming up during this term. Uh, which is, which is, do you, anybody know when, which is when? I'll tell you. Yeah, you see, one is on the 22nd, uh, another is towards in June. We have, one is Vajrasattva empowerment, so this will, that Vajrasattva empowerment uh, will give you the opportunity to receive the full uh, can instructions instru and em empowerment to do the uh, transmission of the practice of Vajrasattva because to purify karma, everybody is given this, Not nothing unique about you and me. Everybody practices, even, he, even his soul is Dalai Lama do it every day. <laughs> That's why he rises up so early. Vajrasattva is on the 22nd of May. Yeah. And then the Chenrezigs, you got uh, Chenrezigs on the... June. 12th of June. 12th of June, yeah. So we have the 22nd, which is actually next week, isn't it? Uh, Thursday, next week. Thursday next week. Thursday next week evening. Yeah. Uh, there's actually a whole group of other people joining as well because we have one course happening on 
on the on the Thursday nights that Minda is leading, that they are all learning to do these practices. So we have combined this so that more people can learn these prescribed practices. Instead of making the Tuesday night class like more dry, academic, philosophical things, we want people to actually adopt the practices. So that's why it's designed that in Thursday week, uh, we give in the Vajrasattva, and then once you receive it, then you can join the actual Wednesday evening practices, 7 o'clock one, where we do that every week, so that you actually have opportunity to learn to do the practices group, and then also then learn to do on your own. So that's, that's the sort of thing we are uh, creating um, uh, this situation. So uh, one needs to receive these transmissions, uh, and, the, and then uh, then the par- part of the practice, four powers, is last of the practice, power of restoration. At the end of the meditation, you feel completely restored, your dignity, your confidence, your acceptance of yourself, your self-esteem, your Buddha nature. You know, we, lots of people have so much guilt about their wrongdoings and also so much resentment to other people's wrongdoing. And that's in the Vajrayana practices, and teach, Buddhist teachings are so kind that people don't want to be so judgmental to themselves or others. They should say so that everybody is human being. They're all entitled to go to, to learn through their mistakes. Nobody's born perfect and no they will die perfect. <laughs> and so it's good to be able to practice the teachings through which we learn to forgive each other and forgive ourselves. So that at the end of the practice, then the Hawan is meant to feel really restored, no longer have the same guilt or regret about that and animosity and judgment towards others, and they recovered, you know. So one does make a habit of doing that. That practice, Vajrasattva practice, only about 20 minutes practice. If one does that daily, it's a hugely powerful practice. One of the most famous practices recommended daily. And then here I have given you, is if you, if you, just for the sake of this class, what you do is you can recite this verse. This verse is made, is, is authored by Samandabhadra Bodhisattva, one verse confession. Every misdeed I have committed with my body, voice, and mind, by the strength of faith and good action, I confess them each and every one. And after that, then you recite Tadhyata Om Muni Muni Ma Muni Shakya Muni Sova Tadhyata Om Muni Muni Ma Muni Shakya Muni Sova Tadhyata Om Muni Muni Ma Muni Shakya Muni Sova Tadhyata Om Muni Muni Ma Muni Shakya Muni Sova Tadhyata Om Muni Ma Muni Shakya Muni Sova Tadhyata Om Muni Muni Ma Shakya Muni Sova so that's a very short version, but one shouldn't ignore this saying it's short. It's just being able to say that is also a great blessing. Just memorize this verse and recite this mantra. Shakyamuni Buddha's mantra is universal, and so it's good. So that's um, uh, and that will be very good to adopt. And then to conclude here, the summary of the uh, understanding of analytical meditation karma is uh, that if you understand karma and you in, go in, employ your mind to think along the conscious awareness of what is this the cause that I'm creating the result for? Is this the result I want? Do I get this result by doing this? Just having that kind of mindfulness is constant meditation, actually. Constant meditation, and a summary of that is success of change attitude on cause and effect. No, this is not the cause for that. This is this is cause for this. You got it wrong here. <laughs> if you want to, if you say this, if you think like that, this is not this is not good cause. This will bring this result. <laughs> this is salt. This is pepper. This is chili. This is sugar. <laughs> so you you recognize the ingredients very well and check which should go in which food. Uh, <laughs> does this goes in this? This no, no, no. And then removing wrong views, <laughs> removing wrong views, saying that you don't believe in karma. It's not a belief. It's just awareness. It's not that you believe in some theory. It's actually we are aware. We are always very careful. When you drive carefully, you reach safely. <laughs> it's just simple as that. And you and you forgot, and you drank a little bit at the family friend's party, and then you forgot that you have to drive. Yet then you can't drive. 
<laughs> the other the other morning, you know, this is four thirty in the morning, on our then uh, I get up around that time and I notice somebody just just parked on the our next to our nature strip. I thought uh, what what must have happened an accident or something. I went there. The guy was sitting there and holding the steering wheel, but, but he's not. <laughs> And I thought, hey, maybe need, I knocked his window and I said, what's wrong? He says, ah, oh, I'm fine, my dear. I, I'm not safe to drive. I had too much to drink up the club last night. So cute. <laughs> <laughs> he's really good, you know. He didn't want to go to go drive because he knows that he's, if he leaves, goes the main road, he's, he's, he's not only a danger to the road, but also to others. So he's just sitting there. He said, hopefully I will, I will get that things will clear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I said, do you need help? He said, no, no, I just, I just need to sit there. It's just like that. It's that's kind of mindfulness. <laughs> he, he mustn't be totally drunk. Huh? <laughs> he, he's aware that he's drunk. He's got the danger of being caught anyway. <laughs> and so he's stopping there and he doesn't want to drive. So it's that kind of mindfulness is what is changing the attitude about. You know, it's not the police or the road that is against us, but oneself is not safe to be there in the first place. And so he was, he was, he was parking there and I didn't mind it. <laughs> Otherwise, otherwise, seeing we just had the gardener come and mow the lawn the day before, and he's just parking on the. <laughs> so I, I had to change my karma, <laughs> my attitude. <laughs> no, my intention wasn't really so much. Maybe he needs a help, but then, and firstly thinking, what? Well, why is sitting there type of thing? <laughs> it just changed my attitude because he 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 sounded very careful, you know. Mm. So that's the talking about. Mindfulness of cause and effect, and uh, removing the wrong view that what we do has no consequences, and and they will have consequences, and being able to avoid the smallest, you know, do not think of a small virtue will not reward in the future, just as falling drops of water will fill a large container, and likewise, do not think of a small misdeeds will not result in the future, just a spark of fire could incinerate whole forest and leave no trace of it. So there is no small karma uh, that is ignorable, and so there's no small, small karma that we should uh, dismiss it, whether virtue or non-virtue. And that is really meditative, meditative in the sense, it makes us much more present. So, so that's, that's all we have time for tonight. We will conclude here. Thank you for your your karma of listening to the teachings, uh, which 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 creates a opportunity for me to have have a good Tuesday evening. <laughs> so, so we will conclude here. We will say the prayers on page eleven and twelve, uh, which is to <clears throat> share the merits and dedicate uh, for the benefit of all as we intended. By the merit of this merit and the state of omniscience, defeat the evil enemies of defilements. May I liberate all sentient beings from the samsaric oceans, the turbulent waves of birth, all this sickness and death. By listening to the precious and excellent mind and our teachings, whatever boundless merit I require, may all sentient beings become precious and to retain excellent and precious mind and our teachings. May the supreme and precious Bodhicitta take birth when not done so. Where it is born, may it increase abundantly without degeneration.